we jump into worship and the word this morning, we have just a few announcements to share with you. First, there is just a reminder that all in-person ministries have been suspended for the time being. We will do our best to use the technology of the day to stay connected with you all. Sunday services and Wednesday night youth services will be posted every week on these online platforms. YouTube and or Facebook, that's at MPCC of San Jose, and of course our website, mpccsj.org. Even though we are not meeting in person, you can still stay faithful in giving. Along with mailing in your checks, you can also use one of our electronic options. First, you can visit our website at mpccsj.org and click on the Giving tab on the homepage. You can also use the Church Center app, which is available on Google Pay or the App Store. And you can also give through text by texting the dollar amount to the number 84321. If you need any instruction or help with the electronic giving options, do not hesitate to contact us. We would love to assist you in any way. God bless you, church. Stand with me and uh, let's enter into worship this morning. It's a wonderful day. Uh, Let's just enter into the presence of God. Amen. spoke a word you are singing over me shadow. There's no shadow you won't lie. 
light of the mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down your praise and our hearts will cry and these bones will sing great are you Lord and all the earth will shout your praise and our hearts will cry and these bones will sing great
Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great and mighty to be served. Oh, we lift your name. Oh, we lift your name on high. Great are you, Lord. Singing great. live with the people of God. Amen. I've heard it before. People have said it to me over the last several weeks. Hey, Pastor Matt, nothing against the, the recorded services that we've been doing, but there's something about that live anointing. Amen. That's what it is. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit at that moment to do what needs to be done so the people receive what they need to receive. Amen. So we just are so thankful for each and every one of you for tuning in this morning. Again, we are live. This is happening right now. So again, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for your faithfulness over the last several months as we've been learning, you know, kind of been thrown in the deep end as it were, learning how to put together these services. And, uh, and here we are now at a point where we can do this in real time. So again, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving as well. I know it has not been easy. A lot of you have been out of work, but you have stayed faithful in the tithe and in that above and beyond offering. I want to thank you for that, and I want to encourage you. We're all in this together, right? We need to continue moving forward, continue in that faithfulness in giving as much as we can. Amen. God will bless you. Well, we want to jump right into a brand new series. It's about a three or four part series that we're going to be uh, uh, diving into in these next uh, few weeks. And it's one that is uh, very um, relevant for this moment that we find ourselves in right now. This place in history where things are, are just so crazy, where you and I are having to experience things in, in, a, in a different way. Things that we've never had to experience. I mean, you take the, the, the pandemic, for, for instance. Nobody's experienced anything like that in the United States of America for, for, for over 100 years, where everything has shut down. And we have been, you know, asked to shelter in place and stay at home. So learning how to do ministry in the midst of just that by itself is, is a task. But we need to be encouraged to continue moving forward no matter what. Say that with me. No matter what. We keep moving forward. The mission never ended. It never stopped. The vision is still clear. In fact, the Word of God tells us that, that we better not lose our vision, right? Because people without vision, they perish. Another translation says they cast off restraints. We do not want to cast off what God has put upon our shoulders. The burden for the lost, the burden for this world, Lord. Uh, you know, so we need to keep moving forward. So let the Lord bless you this morning as we talk about this. I'm going to say a word to you, and I, and I know it's going to evoke maybe a response within you, right? You're going to think of some things. You're going to get some pictures in your mind. Are you ready for it? It's the word 
comfort. Say that with me. Comfort, right? That word is, it's, it's a great word. And for me, I don't know about you, but it brings about good, warm feelings whenever I hear it. When I hear that word, uh, or even think about that word comfort, a few things I, I, I think about instantly, just like that. The first is, uh, myself as a child, uh, you know, it's a cold, rainy day. I'm sitting on the couch in, in, in my, my parents' house in the living room. I've got a, a warm blanket over my shoulders, a hot bowl of, of Campbell's chicken noodle soup in my lap, and I'm just enjoying the comfort of the warmth. While outside everything is storming, I'm inside warm and secure. When I think about that word comfortable, I think about that. Or I think about as a child just crawling up into my mama's lap, right? And just soaking in her warmth and her love as she watched the guiding light, right? Sorry, mom, you, I, I had to expose you. While she watched her soap operas, I would sit right there on her lap and just soak up that warmth and that love. That's what I think about when I think of comfort. And let me give you one more. It was a couch that Lorraine and I owned early on in our marriage. It was this amazing, uh, deep hunter green corduroy couch. You would sit on that thing, and as soon as you did, you would sink into it, and all of your cares would just melt away, right? That, when I think about comfort, that's what I think about. My mom always thinks I'm crazy because I love rainy days so much. Well, it's her fault. She made me feel so warm and so secure on those, those rainy days that that's why I love the rain so much. But we think about comfort, it evokes a response within us, right? Whether it's an audible response or a visual in, a, in, our, in our minds, but we hear that word and we think of certain things. Comfort is a good word and it's a great feeling. There's nothing wrong with it in the right context. When you sit down and rest, you want to do that in comfort. When you sleep at night, you want to sleep comfortably. And when you need to de decompress from a stressful day and just relax, you want to be comfortable while you do it. But when it comes to our life and our walk with Christ, we should be anything but comfortable. When it comes to our, our life and our walk with Jesus Christ, comfort can be dangerous. My, my daughters, uh, Hannah and Azariah, they share a room together. And the other day I walked in, and, and my daughter Hannah, she likes to paint pictures, and, you know, uh, she's got them hung on the wall. And there was one particular one that I didn't see. I didn't even know she painted. And uh, I went in to, to flip off the lights, and I saw it right there above the light switch. And so I walked in, and I, I looked at it and, and it, and it, and it had a saying on it. And, again, I've never seen it, but that saying jumped out at me. She's a great artist, but it was what it said, not how it was painted. And this is what it said. It said that your comfort zone will kill you. Your comfort zone will kill you. When I saw that, I mean, it, it was like a, a punch in the face, you know, a kick in the gut, you know what I mean? I always tell you that, that I'm the, the kind of person that, that doesn't want chicken soup for the soul. I want a swift kick in the pants from the Lord, amen? I need to, to be motivated to move forward, right? And again, chicken soup for the soul, that's comfortable. It's the oohs and the ahs makes you feel good. But the kick in the pants makes you move forward, right? It encourages you, encourages you to keep moving. So when I saw that, I knew, God, you were, you were giving that to me in that moment for this moment right here. He, he planted a seed within me for this series over the next several weeks so that I could speak this truth to you as we find ourselves in the midst of this craziness, right? So I believe that, that, that God does not want us to be uncomfortable. And so that is the title of our, 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 our series for the next several weeks. It is simply called Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Comfortable. I believe that we as the body of Christ have grown comfortable in our churches, enjoying the safety and the security of our four walls and our traditional Sunday services. We've grown so comfortable in these things that we've, forgiven, we've forgotten that Jesus came to upset the apple cart, as it were, concerning traditions. Okay? He came to destroy our comfortable dis, uh, d traditions and trade them in for a lifestyle and a ministry that focuses less on what happens in the Sunday services and more what happens in the days between those services. All we've done is trade in one set of traditions for others, and we're not supposed to do that. He came to, to again, upset that apple cart. Some of us have been sitting on the fence. He came to kick that fence down and force us into a place where we make a decision. We're either going to fish or cut bait. 
Amen? We're either going to fish or cut bait. So that is where we're coming from today. Because I believe that we as the church have become too comfortable in our norms. Right? In our norms. Jesus didn't come to make us comfortable. He came to do the opposite. And and this is kind of like our base scripture uh, for this series. And I want you to see it and hear it today. It comes out of the book of Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. It says, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. He said, I didn't come to make things all hunky-dory, right? I didn't come to to, to bring sunshine and roses. No, I came to bring, bring, to upset that apple cart, to, to bring discomfort to this world. Not peace, but a sword. Okay, we do want to possess a, a, a certain type of peace. And just like comfort, that peace in the right context is a good thing. But if we find ourselves too peaceful, so peaceful that we're not moving, we're just falling asleep, then there's a problem. Okay, there is a problem. Family, don't sleep when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to doing what God called you to do. And that family is where we kind of find ourselves uh, in, in our lives right now. This year alone, we've been, again, confronted with so many different things that we've never experienced. We've been confronted with a virus and a, a, ne- a nationwide shelter in place, wildfires on the West Coast, hurricanes in the South, right? And we have uh, violence erupting in every, almost every major American city. And then the, the hotter than usual political unrest. And while all this stuff is going down, Church services, as we know them, have been banned. Yeah, seriously, they've been banned. You're not supposed to have them. Churches are getting fined in our state $5,000 each in-person service they have if they choose to do so. And, and, and Christians are losing their minds about this. And again, for, for a, a certain point of that, I, I can understand that. Anytime change is introduced into our lives, even the Christian life, it, it, it causes us to flip our wig. And, and folks, Christians are flipping their wigs this, in this day and this hour that we find ourselves in. Because we feel that our answer was found on Sunday mornings. But I believe that God has allowed this to happen. God doesn't cause bad things to happen. He says every good gift comes from God, right? Only the good gifts come from God. But bad things do happen because sin entered the garden once upon a time. But God will allow those things to be used to to, to shuffle his people into the place that he wants them. He will allow those things to maneuver us to where he wants us to be to experience that greater blessing. So I believe that God is showing us something. He is allowing our discomfort to show us what is truly important and where our focus really needs to be. And folks, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not the Sunday services. Because too many Christians have made that the end all and the be all of their Christian experience. And that is not it. We, we say, well, we can't go to church. No, you, you can have church in your living room, right? You, you, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is just a building. You know, that's easy for you to say, Pastor Matt. You get to be there this morning. Get that out of your head. Get that out of your head. I'm here because this is a normal backdrop for you. But I could do it outside. I could do it from my home and we'd still have church because it's not about the building, it's about the bricks that make it up. Not the physical bricks, but you. You are the church of Jesus Christ. And so we need to focus not on the Sunday morning, but what happens Monday through Saturday. Amen. What we can do instead of what we can't. So God wants us to be uncomfortable, but uncomfortable with what? There's three things that we're going to cover in the next several weeks. Today, we're going to cover the first one. And and in order to be truly uncomfortable and allow it to be effective in our life and lead us to a place where where things are actually happening, good things are happening, we have to first, and you've heard me say it before, start right here. So the first thing that we have to do is be uncomfortable with our distance from God. So if you're taking notes this morning, write that down. Maybe somebody could write that in in the chat this morning. Point number one is... Become uncomfortable with our sin, ourselves, or our distance from God. Okay, because remember, again, it all starts with us. Anytime we want to see change take place, it always needs to start with us. Okay, you can never bring about change in anyone or in any situation until you first look at yourself to make sure that you are in a position to affect that type of change. 
So it has to start with you. And I always look at change this way. If you want to change a situation, you've got to change the people involved in that situation. If you want to change the people that are involved in that situation, you've got to start with yourself. And if you want to start with yourself, affecting change in your own life, the first place you start with is your heart. That, per, that part of you that is connected to God. That spiritual part of who you are. So in order to get uncomfortable with our distance from God and allow it to affect positive change, not just in our lives, in others' lives, we have to start first with us. So our first point this morning is mind the gap. Say that. Mind the gap. You know what that means, right? Anybody ever heard that, that phrase before or that saying? Well, we know what a gap is, right? It's the space between two objects or two places or two things, right? So it's the space between. And mind the gap it is an audible and visual warning phrase that is issued to rail passengers who ride the London Underground in, in UK, right? That's the subway system that runs underneath uh, 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 London. It was, it was introduced, I think, somewhere in the late 60s, and it's a, it's a round sign. It's blue and red, and I think it has black letters, and it simply says, mind the gap. And it was a warning to passengers that when they boarded the train, there was a space between the platform and the doors, right? So mind the gap between the platform and the train. Why would they do that? Because people who are unaware, who are not uh, uh, looking at their surroundings and paying attention, fell through that gap. And folks, that is a bad thing. I've seen video of people who have accidentally fell through and the train operator didn't know and it began to go. Or it, 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 It's horrible. These people lose their lives in the, most, in the worst way possible. So they put up that sign and they play it audibly. It's visual. Everybody knows who rides the London Underground to mind the gap. Mind the gap. So what does this mean for us spiritually? We need to beware of the distance between us and God. We are on the platform, God is the train, right? So we need to make sure that we mind the gap between us and God. And how do we do that? We start off by asking ourselves this question. Have I been walking around blissfully blind to the fact that there is distance between myself and God? Have, have I been walking around? You know, they say that word, that, that phrase, ignorance is bliss, right? And you've just been going about your day-to-day, -day, enjoying your Sunday services and doing the regular stuff during the week, Monday through Saturday, and going to church again, and oh, everything's just hunky-dory, while, while you are completely unaware that, that there's a gap between you and God. There's distance between you and Him. Maybe it's time for the church right now, where we find ourselves in, right? Maybe it's time for us to self-check. To take spiritual inventory. Because here's the thing, folks. Sometimes, a lot of times throughout Scripture, we see God didn't wait for His people to, to figure out, oh, you know what? I think I'm a little bit too comfortable. You know, I, I need to make myself uncomfortable. You know, He never waited. He would see them comfortable in their ways. He would warn them. And then He would send something. Right? His people got comfortable. They began to do things that they weren't supposed to do. And we would see invading Nations come in and take them over and put them into captivity. You know, all the, we, we see that all throughout Scripture. God does not wait for us to figure it out. If we do, that's great. We repent of it and we get back on track. But God will not wait. He will allow uh, some discomfort into your life for you to get it. So maybe right now is a good point before we start getting even more uncomfortable than we already are to self-check and, and take spiritual inventory of our life. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about this. Paul was, he was warning the people to not be like their ancestors who we just talked about. They witnessed the miraculous power of God uh, as they were being led out of Egypt in the great exodus, right? They got the cloud that led them, the fire, right? Uh, they were, um, they saw the parting of the Red Sea. They walked on dry land. On the other side, when they got hungry, there was manna from heaven and quail and water from a rock. These people saw so many miracles. They even at one point heard the voice of God. They were tired of hearing it from Moses. They said, we want to hear God. He spoke to them. They ran and hid because they were so terrified, right? They heard and seen these amazing things from God, and still they fell away. Still they committed adultery with other gods, right? They cheated on God. 
right? And, and, and so Paul is saying, do not fall into this category. In fact, uh, right here in, in uh, verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 10, you'll see it right there on your screen. It says, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. If you think you are standing firm, be careful because you might fall. There's a good chance that you are going to fall because you are not minding the gap. You are not paying attention to the fact that there is distance between you and God. This is dangerous. Your comfort zone can kill you. It will kill you if you're not aware. Beware of things that put distance between you and God. And one of the biggest ones we'll talk about right here this morning. Satisfaction. Come on, say it with me. Satisfaction. It's a great word. There, again, in the right context, there is nothing wrong with being satisfied. It's a great thing. But spiritual satisfaction breeds laziness. Think about it with me. After you eat a big meal, and folks, we're, we're, I know some of you are counting the days like me until November hits, especially that beautiful, wonderful day in November besides my birthday, which is the 21st, by the way, just, just to let you know. Um, anyways, Thanksgiving, right? We look forward to Thanksgiving. Why? <laughs> because turkey, right? Because stuffing, because gravy, right? Right? Greens, beans, potatoes, tomatoes, chicken, turkey, chicken, turkey, right? We love that stuff. We, we can't wait. We are counting down the minutes. Yesterday in the blistering heat, my daughter, Azariah, sitting next to me, she goes, oh, I can't wait until Thanksgiving. I'm like, man, girl, we got a couple months to go. Just hold tight. It's coming. But she's like her daddy. She can't wait. We gorge ourselves on food that day until we are more than satisfied. And the first thing we want to do is kick everybody out of our house, go sit down in a comfortable chair or lay down in our beds and take a nap. Come on, don't lie. Testify, right? You know what I'm talking about. You know that you do that. We all do. Well, guess what, folks? The same thing spiritually happens when we get satisfied. We get lazy. We want to sit down. We want to take a nap. All forward motion, all forward progress ceases. It stops. It is non-existent, and we begin to spiritually take naps. That is not what God had in mind for his people, right? We have become satisfied with our Christian lives. We enjoy our traditional church services on Sunday, and then go on living our normal lives Monday through Saturday. Listen, Jesus did not die on the cross and raise to life on the third day and ascend to the right hand of the Father for you to be lazy and for you to experience life or do life normal. You are not called to be normal. The very fact that you said yes to a God who is invisible, you can't see, you can't touch him, right? Nobody else can, can see him and therefore they don't believe in him, but you opened your heart to God. You talk to God on a daily basis, right? You are abnormal. In fact, the Bible says that we're supposed to be a peculiar people. We are strange. We stick out like a sore thumb. We are not mediocre. We are not ordinary. We are extraordinary, right? You are extra. That's not a bad thing when it comes to spiritual things. Maybe in, in the worldly kind of things, somebody calls you extra, that's pretty bad. But in, in, in spiritual things, we are called to be extraordinary, amen? So we're not called to, to be normal. We're called to stick out. We are called to be extraordinary. And the first step is that we as the church have to admit that there's a problem, right? That, that, that we're, that's where true change begins, where we finally figure out and vocalize, I have a problem. I have an issue. You talk to anybody who's in recovery. And recovery doesn't just cover like, like drugs and alcohol and sexual sins and stuff like that. No, no, no. There are so many things that we become addicted to. So many things that become life-controlling issues, hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Amen to all my people in Celebrate Recovery. You guys know the first step in recovery is admitting that there is a problem. Church, we got a problem. We have a problem. We are focused on the wrong thing, our comfort. And now God has brought a little discomfort in our life to wake us up. Amen? So first, we need to learn how to mind that gap, how to be aware that there is one. Second, we need to learn how to judge the gap. What does that mean? It means that we know there's a distance, so now we have to begin to measure that distance. How far away from God 
am I? The first thing that you need to do is you need to ask yourself, is there distance between me and God? So we talked about being aware of that, right? But we need to ask ourselves. So a good way for you to find out if there is a distance between you and God is to find out if you still have flesh on your bones. Go ahead, try it right now. Just pinch your skin, right? Some of us gets a little bit more than others, right? That's all right. You got flesh on your bones. You want to know why? Because you're a human. You're alive. In fact, when, when I said that, you're probably like, what, what, what does that have to do with anything? Of course I have flesh on my bones. I'm a living human being. That's what we have. Yes, but let's think about this in spiritual terms, okay? Flesh in the Bible equals sin, equals our distance from God. It's the thing that separates us from God. Why do you think God required burnt sacrifices in the Old Testament? God loves the smell of dead, burning flesh because it means that the, that thing that stands between us is removed. It is removed, and him and I, you and he, can be together again. When our flesh is gone, our spirit is closer to God. So we do have that, that you know, level of flesh on our bones, right? We have flesh. We all have a level of it, but how much of it do you have? There is a distance between you and, you and God and, and me and God because he is spirit and we are flesh, right? He is perfect. We are in perfection, right? He is sinless and spotless. We are sinful and full of spots. We got all kinds of stuff going on in our life that separates us from God. That's why he sent Jesus to become the filter so that when you and I stand in the, the, the unwatered down, not candy-coated presence of God, Jesus is our filter. When God looks down at us, when, we, when we're in his presence, he doesn't see the filth of our sin. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. Our image is filtered through the blood of Jesus. Aren't you glad that you are blood washed and blood bought because now you can stand in the presence of God and he will receive you, not because of you, but because of the mark of his son on your life and because of you, because he loves you, right? But he couldn't be where you are until Jesus became that filter, right? So again, we do have flesh, but, but the better question is not just how much do we have, how much are we controlled by our flesh because you all have it i have it we all have a tendency to want to be carnal to want to be sinful it's our nature right but how much of it do we have in our lives and me meaning meaning how much of a control does it have over you and i how much are we allowing our flesh our carnality to control our thoughts and our actions i'm going to be honest with you man even though i'm a pastor i'm still a human being i still have flesh and there are still things that i'm working out and working through folks and i know you you are too but i want you to hear it from me as a pastor as soon as i accepted that calling or was voted in no special thing fell on me and and and, and caused me to be sinless no i have to work just as hard as you do and sometimes well, I don't want to say even harder, but because of my position, right, people view me as this holy man. Folks, I am, not, I am not holy. I am a sinner that is in need of a Savior to make me holy. So I have to work just as hard as you to, um, to work away the flesh's uh, control over my life, right? The thing that I got from Jesus when he came into my, into my life was not the fact that I won't be affected by sin anymore. No, I have the strength. I have the power of the Holy Spirit within me. I have the power of Jesus Christ that works through me to say no to sin and to push it away. To push down the flesh. Or to, better than that, we don't want to push anything down or bury things because if we do, they're going to come back, right? We put them on the altar and we kill them dead. He gives me the power and you the power to lay our flesh on the altar as living sacrifices and burn them away. So we don't want to be controlled by our flesh. So the next question for us is, okay, is there a gap, number one? Number two, how much of a gap is there? How much of the flesh is, ha has control on my life? And this is only a question that you can answer. Galatians 5 gives us a glimpse of what a life um, that is kind of led by the flesh looks like. And you're going to see this scripture on the screen. Some of you know this well. It's Galatians 5, uh, uh, verses 19 through 21. It says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness and orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's some heavy hitters in this list 
of fleshly activity, right? There's some big ones. We're talking about that sexual immorality. We're talking about, you know, the, the orgies and all that stuff. You hear those words and you're like, ew, that, that's not me. Okay, so maybe it's not. Well, let, let's look at the words in between here. Let's look at things like impurity. What's impure? Anything that is not pure. Anything that is not godly. That can even mean our thoughts. And you know from the word of God that our thoughts can be just as sinful as our deeds so how many impure thoughts do you have? I know how many I have that I have to constantly deal with and give to God. Kill dead. Impurity. Debauchery. That's uh, drunkenness. Partying, right? It's, it's, it's raucous living. Now, now, some of us may not be heavily involved in that, but some of us may and struggle with that. That's something that we need to remove from our life. Idolatry. We're not talking about statues of gold, silver, wood, stone. We're talking about statues made out of electronic components like our TVs and our computers. It could even be a flesh and blood human being that you have put higher than God because that's an idol. Something that you put higher than God. Witchcraft, where you're like... I'm safe from that. I don't practice witchcraft. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe you don't have a pentagram drawn, you know, on your, on your garage floor with candles and blood sprinkled in the middle. Maybe you don't. But I remember a little scripture in the Old Testament that talked about rebellion being the sin of divination, a.k.a. witchcraft. So if we are in rebellion against God, guess what? Witchcraft. Hatred. Some of us have a passionate dislike for me. I don't really hate them, but I dislike them with the passion. Yeah, that's hatred. And the Bible says if you hate your brother, you, you know, it's like killing them. It's like committing murder. Folks, we got to remove hatred from our hearts. Discord. That means we like to cause problems, right? We, we, we like drama. There are people who have what I call a soap opera syndrome, right? They like to cause problems and sit back and watch. And they're just like that meme where they're eating popcorn, right? Just watching what goes on. That's discord, right? Jealousy. I think all of us have experienced those things. Even pastors do. When you see big churches and, and you see, you know, these worship teams and you see this and you see that and, and the facilities and the ministries that they do and you're the small guy and you're going, wow, must be nice, right? We deal with jealousy. We got to put that thing to death. Fits of rage. You know, the Bible says that anger is not a sin. It, it says what you do with it is, right? And it also says don't go to bed being angry. Right? So anger is not a sin, but if you jump into fits of rage, that's, ta that's talking about throwing stuff, scaring people with your anger. Folks, we can't have that in our life. Selfish ambition. Right? When you, when you tow that, that, that line that the world gives you, that, hey, you worry about yourself. Take care of yourself, man. you got to do you first. The Bible tells us that we're not supposed to do what's good for us. We're supposed to lift our brothers and sisters higher than self. We're supposed to give them preference over us, so selfish ambition, stepping on people to get to the next rung of the ladder, that's wrong. Dissension, that means causing discord, it means causing division within people, uh, be, or between people. I've seen too many churches split because Christians didn't know how to behave. Folks, we cannot have dissension. Factions, cliques, right? People uh, 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 just grouping up, and it's us for and no more. That is a sin. We can't be involved in that. This place is open to everybody. I am the pastor of everybody. You are the brother of everybody or the sister of everybody within this church. It's not about a group. It's about the whole. It's about all of us. And then envy. Think about that. When you're looking at some, something that somebody has, you, and it goes more than I wish I had that. Right? You just find yourself coveting that thing every day. It rules your thoughts. That is envy. Folks, here is a list right here that we are not supposed to partake of. These things should not be in our life. And if they are, we need to be actively working against these fleshly things. Because that is not what the church is supposed to be about. So that's what it looks like, right? That's the measure. So in here you can find how much your flesh is controlling you as, as opposed to the Spirit of God controlling your life. And don't just measure the distance. Don't just look at this list, right? You need to figure out why there is a distance between you and God. Because these are symptoms, folks. These are symptoms. Just like addiction, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, all addictions are symptoms of a deeper issue, a deeper problem. You need to be willing to do the work. When I did counseling for Teen Challenge, I, that's what we would do in every session that I would have with these guys and these couples, right? What is the issue and, and where, where is the deeper issue that is causing these outer lying ones? Here are your symptoms. What is the deeper problem? 
right? You're, you, you're angry at your wife and you don't trust her. Why? Because somewhere in your life, maybe your mom left you and, and abandoned you. And you deal with abandonment issues. And so, so you knew that when you got a wife, you know, and she was a mother of your kids, at some point she may leave. Well, she's not your mom. You need to deal with that problem. You see what I'm saying? We, n- we need not just deal with the symptoms, but the problem. Because the symptoms aren't going to go away until we deal with the deeper issue. So we can't just measure the distance. We have to go deep and find out why there is a distance there in the first place. And once you can admit that there's a distance between you and God, and then you've measured that distance and figured out why that distance exists, first you mine the gap, then you judge the gap, you measure the gap, then you can do our final point. The final thing this morning, you can close the gap. Mind the gap, judge that gap, measure it, and then work to close that gap. The Bible tells us that God is inexhaustible. You know what that means? There's no limit. There's no limit to his goodness. There's no limit to his power. There's no limit to his love for you and I. There's no limit to his desire to better your life and make you who he called you and created you to be. He is inexhaustible. So what that means to me is that you and I must exhaust every resource that we have in order to discover more and more and more of God. Amen? This is not the picture of comfort, right? Exhaustion is the opposite of comfort. But the Bible leads us to believe because God is inexhaustible. We need to exhaust ourselves in seeking Him out, in searching Him out, in knowing Him better. The good thing is, is the Bible tells us when you are weary and heavy laden, He said, come to me and I will give you rest, right? It's right there in the pages of Matthew 11. He says, come to me, lay down your burdens, and I will give you rest for your soul. We are called to become uncomfortable in our life, in our walk that we have with Jesus. If you came into this thing thinking all your problems were going to melt away, somebody sold you a bill of goods, right? I I told you this before. If you believe that, then I've got some beachfront uh, property in Montana that I'd like to sell you today because it's a lie. That's a lie. When you come to Christ, things don't get easier. I came not to bring peace, but a sword, right? A sword is not comfortable. It cuts, right? It penetrates. It, it, It slashes and tears. That is the opposite of comfort. Jesus died on the cross not so you can kick back in a spiritual lazy boy and take a nap. He came to ruffle feathers. He came to upset the apple cart. He came for you to rise up and take arms and to fight this good fight against the enemy and to save the souls of those who are lost, just like you and I once upon a time were. Again, that is not the picture of comfort. It's the exact opposite. In fact, it's making ourselves uncomfortable on purpose. No, better yet, it's making ourselves uncomfortable with purpose, right? We're not just going to be tired for being tired's sake because we've just been running around doing nothing. It's not because we're running around on a treadmill, you know, doing a whole bunch of work going nowhere. No, we're doing something with a purpose. We are exhausted uncomfortable with a purpose. Take your focus, number one, in order to do that, you need to take your focus off of the things of this world and put them on God. You need to worry less about what is going on as far as the world is concerned and how it affects you. Yes, you need to be mindful of what's going on because you need to know how to attack every situation, right? But stop looking at it through eyes of how is this going to make me comfortable? Because we already established you gave your life to Christ, you're going to be uncomfortable. Period. Come on, just put a period on the end of that sentence and own it. I gave my heart to Christ, therefore now I am going to be uncomfortable in this life. The things that you used to like to do that were sinful, you're going to be uncomfortable with it. The people you used to hang around with who don't want to hear nothing about God, you're going to be uncomfortable around those things. You're going to be uncomfortable. So let's get that into our minds. So stop looking at everything in this world through a lens of how this is going to bring me goodness or comfort. We need to stop putting our focus on the things of the world and put them on God. So there's a quote that the world likes to uh, say to us Christians. It says, hey, go ahead, man. You know, every every man for himself, do whatever you want to do. More power to you if you want to serve God. But don't become so heavenly minded that you become no earthly good. 
right? And I understand where they're coming from with that. They're talking about fanaticism, right? Don't be a a fanatic and, you know, start doing crazy things and, and, and start preaching to me every time you see me and blah, 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 blah. Okay, I get that. But folks, the Word of God tells us otherwise. Look at what it says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He says, since then, you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Here it is. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Boom. Right there in your face. The world can keep saying, don't become so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Right here, Paul is telling us, if you're not heavenly minded, you aren't going to be any good to anyone on this earth. We need to be heavenly minded. And let me remind you, where the Apostle Paul was when he wrote this, he was uncomfortable. Remember, he was just about to start his fourth and final uh, mission uh, crusade, his missionary uh, journey, and then he got arrested and put under house arrest in Rome. He was writing this in shackles. How can a guy who is imprisoned and can't do the will of God, right, what he thought was the will of God, how can he tell us, don't worry about the world Don't worry about becoming uncomfortable. I I think he's the perfect person to tell us that because he's sitting in the midst of uncomfortableness, discomfort. He was supposed to be doing something else for God, and here he is. But remember what I told you the last time we spoke. If Paul wasn't imprisoned in Rome, we would have never got this book. We would have never got Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, or Philemon. We never would have got those things because he wouldn't have been in prison. He wouldn't have wrote them. So here he is writing to us about comfort, about discomfort, right? About setting our minds on the things of God rather than the world, setting our hearts on the things of God rather than the world, right? From from prison. He understands it. He gets it. So you need to be heavenly minded or you will be no good to anyone on this earth. Take your focus off of you. Say it. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about them. It's about the people out there who don't know Christ. I'm uncomfortable so I can win them. I push away comfort. I push away the spiritual naps. I push away resting in God, right? And so we think, so I can save a soul. So I can see somebody receive Christ just like I did once upon a time, years and years ago. And you need to do the same. We as the body of Christ need to take the focus off of ourselves and put it back where it belongs on God and he puts it on people. When you can do that, when you can stop using your voice to complain about how uncomfortable things are making you right now and you can start using your ears instead to listen to the voice of God, you will hear his voice telling you not to worry, that he has everything under control and the most important part, Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Don't stop. You need to exhaust yourself in the pursuit of God. Become heavenly minded or you'll be no earthly good. And lastly, keep moving forward in ministry. Keep ministering. Keep ministering. Keep doing the work of the gospel. God is more than a Sunday thing. I saw that on a shirt as I was scrolling through Facebook the other day. God is more than a Sunday thing. That's right. But do we, as, the, as Christians, as his followers, believe that? Or have we put the end-all, be-all of Christendom on the Sunday service? That's a question we need to ask ourselves, folks. That's a question. So again, I sound like a broken record, but over the last several weeks I've been saying the same thing. The complaining, it's got to stop. Pray about it. Give it to God in, 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 your, in your prayer closet. In your war room, give that complaint to God. You keep moving forward. Keep ministering. If somebody needs groceries, go buy them and drop them off. If somebody needs to talk, call them up. Or go sit on their front porch six feet apart with a mask on your face. If somebody needs something, be the person to provide it. And do it in Jesus' name. Right? Exhaust yourself in the pursuit of God. Keep chasing God. Keep pursuing Him. In fact, right now, we should be doing it more than we ever have before, because it's not just a pandemic anymore. It's all those other things that we mentioned. Turn on the news, and you've got 
a hundred reasons why you should be pressing in deeper to God's presence. Amen? So exhaust yourself in that. Again, become heavenly minded. When you exhaust yourself in the pursuit of God, he becomes all you can think about. Right? And when you're thinking on those things, as God says, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is holy, right? Think on these things. When you're thinking on those things, your actions begin to change. The complaining stops. Right? The, the self-centeredness stops. And you begin focusing on others. What can I do for them rather than what can God do for me or what I can do for myself or what others can do for me. And again, lastly, keep moving forward in ministry. Ministry, the greatest ministry, the best ministry doesn't happen on Sunday, folks, and that's coming from the pastor. Sunday services, that's training day. That's, that's family reunion day. That's where we all come together and encourage one another. We worship God corporately. But Monday through Saturday is, is where the real, true ministry happens because that's when you and I go into the highways and the hedges and, and reach the lost at any cost. Amen? We, we reach the lost. We live intentionally. We don't just preach the gospel. We live and breathe the gospel. We are the gospel of Jesus Christ going out to the world, whether it's in your workplace, whether, whether it's in, in your, your shopping times, right, or where you connect with other people or just seeing your neighbor, right, waving to them. Just share the love of God with them. Be the love of God to those people who are out there, to your neighbors, to your family, to everyone. That is where the true ministry happens. That's grassroots ministry, if we want to use a political term, as it were, as we find ourselves in this, this uh, pre-election climate, right? Yeah, that's grassroots ministry, folks. If you're not willing to hit the ground and to, and to take some steps and to meet some people, are you even ministering? Are you even doing anything? So get out there and connect with people because the best and the greatest ministry happens Monday through Saturday, not just Sunday. Amen? God wants you to move forward with the gospel, preaching the gospel, and ministering just in a different way right now. Folks, he's, he's kind of shaking us up. And we're going to talk about that in the weeks to come. But this morning, I want you to focus on those three things. Mind the gap. Judge the gap. Close the gap. Become aware that there's distance between you and God. Don't just measure it, but find out where it's coming from. And then lastly, handle it. Close that gap between you and God. Amen. Folks, be encouraged. And right now, I want to pray with you and for you that God will give you the strength because your homework this week is those three things. Your homework this week is those th three things. It's time to look at ourselves. If we want to affect change, we need to become uncomfortable with our distance from God and then close the gap. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much this morning, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your great love that you expressed to us on Calvary's cross. Your love wasn't just expressed to us when you created us and when you desired to walk with us in this life, but when we fell away, when our hearts became impure, you sent your only begotten to die on a cross that did not belong to him because he was spotless and perfect. It belonged to us. He died on my cross. You sent your son to die on my cross for my sins. And you set me free. You set me free from all those things that held me, that kept me bound, and kept me from being who you designed me and created me to be. God, I'm so thankful. But sometimes, somewhere in, in, the, in the time between our salvation and, you know, where we find ourselves in life, sometimes we lose focus. Sometimes we get comfortable in the things that we have and we understand. And when change is introduced, when discomfort is introduced, we don't like it. We begin to complain. We begin to shout. We, get to, we begin to get mad at, at people. And instead of looking at ourselves, we look outwardly. God, it's time for us. You're speaking to us today about our comfort zones. And just as I walked in my daughter's room and I saw that, that phrase, your comfort zone will kill you. God, you're, you're shaking your people up. In this time right now, these last six months, this is prime time for us to draw closer to you. To ask you to reveal to us what is wrong in our lives so that we can fix it and we can become better on the other side. This is our lion's den. This is our fiery furnace, God. 
And it's by faith and by our closeness with you. That's what's going to get us out. That's what's going to get us out that next day. Like Daniel, you released him from the lion's den. Those, those lions who were hungry, who hadn't been fed, they were sure they were going to devour him. They purred like kittens in his presence. Because Daniel sought your face in the midst of his den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. In the face of that wicked king, they said, go ahead and throw us in. Our God will save us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow. And in the midst of those flames, there wasn't three, there was a fourth figure, and he looked like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar's official said, there's four people in there. He looks like the son of the gods. This is our fiery furnace. And just like Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, when this is all over, if we stuck with you, if we followed you, if we ministered in the meantime, on the other side of this, we're not even going to smell like smoke. We're going to be all right, and we're going to be better than ever. Father, help us to find you in the midst of the flames. To draw our peace and our comfort from you while at the same time allowing ourselves, making ourselves uncomfortable for the benefit of others. No more complaining. God, it's time for us to spend our effort and our energy in moving forward, not losing our vision and our focus, remembering that the mission is still on and hitting it hard, Lord God. Father, we thank you today. I, I pray that you bless your people and you touch their hearts and you give them the strength and the wherewithal they need in order to do these three things this week, to mind the gap, measure the gap, and close the gap. Bless them now. We thank you. We want to give you the praise and all the glory. And it's in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus that we pray. And we all said, amen and amen. Well, folks, God bless you again. Thank you so much for spending this time uh, with me this morning live. This is precious to me, and I know it's precious to you. Let's take what we learned today and run with it. Remember, grassroots ministry. Let's hit the ground running. Let's move full steam ahead knowing that God is behind us. Amen. I love you folks. God bless you. And until we meet again, we'll see you next week.